we'll uh, hand it over to Kate, who will tell us a number of ways that she has found to save time and make her organization more efficient by using FME. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Dale, and uh, good day, everyone. So uh, today I'm going to be speaking about um, automation of spatial data with FME, and specifically on three ways that time can be saved uh, using FME. So just to give you a, a very brief background about myself and the company that I work for, um, Arup is a large multidisciplinary engineering consulting firm. Um, we have offices in pretty much every continent in the world, um, except for Antarctica, and um, employs about 11,000 people. Now, out of those 11,000 people, there's probably around 50 of us who are employed as full-time GIS analysts. So we're in, a, we're in quite a small minority, but we're working very closely with the engineers, designers, and planners. And a lot of those people are GIS users that we help support in the office. So because we're all mapping folk on the call, I just thought I'd give you a very quick um, map of um, the countries that we have offices in and that we work in. So the type of projects that we get involved with, uh, we get involved in a lot of different projects. Um, some of Arab's more famous projects that you, you will know of is the Bird's Nest Stadium in China or the Sydney Opera House in Australia. Um, I tend to get involved more in infrastructure projects. And this is just a, a really brief snapshot of some large infrastructure projects that have been going on in the last few years. Um, I tend to, sort of the last few years especially, I've been, t uh, I've, I've tend to get involved with, uh, tend to get involved in um, high-speed rail projects, both here in the US and in the UK. So this is um, a workflow that will look familiar to most of you on the webinar today. And these are typical GIS tasks that we all do, no matter what sector you're in. Um, we, as GIS folk, we are gathering spatial data and working with spatial data. So no matter where that information comes from, um, whether you're downloading it from the internet, you know, what's being, collecting, um, being collected on site, uh, we, we collect that information and we manage it. We put it into a usable format that other people can then use um, for their projects. Uh, we also analyze that information because data in its raw format is not always very useful on its own. It needs to be analyzed and collated in some way. And then we share it um, because obviously, unless we share it, that data is useless to others. So whether it's that raw information that we're sharing or the analyzed information that we're sharing, we need to send it out, whether in another data format or in a, a PDF and a pretty map. So this is just a really brief uh, snapshot of the types of software that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is, of course, no, by no means a comprehensive list. Um, there's a lot of other softwares out there that we, that we as GIS folk use um, within our work. But within the engineering sector, we're working as GIS folk, we're working with this sort of software, but the engineers are working with the software on the right. So things like AutoCAD and uh, the AutoCAD suite of products and the Bentley suite of products, um, and of course Adobe PDFs uh, for, for images and, and maps that are going out. Um, I've put Excel on the left there as well, something that we work with. Of course, Excel can be something on the right there as well. Everybody loves a, everybody loves a spreadsheet. And of course, we need to get data um, to flow between the different types of software that we're using and that others are using. So to give a um, brief overview of the type of data that we're working with, this should look familiar to, to most of you on the call. Um, aerial imagery, obviously very important, so we can give some context. Um, data that you've downloaded from the internet, such as um, land parcels or existing infrastructure. Um, this data tends to come in different types of formats. Then, of course, you get um, design data that might be coming from, from an engineer. So, for example, a railway alignment tends to get modeled in a Bentley software program called Inroads, and that comes as, a, as an ALG file. And all this data that comes in will come in a, in a particular type of format, but it needs to go through into other different types of formats for other people to use. An ALG is useless unless you are using Inroads or um, MicroStation and needs to be converted into, into a geodatabase or into a KML file for Google Earth 
or into a DWG if somebody wants to use it in AutoCAD. Um, likewise with aerial imagery, TIFF files are, are huge, um, and actually I'll go into this a, a bit later. Um, they can be converted into JPEGs, which make them a lot smaller for your network drive. And then of course, things like land parcels or existing infrastructure often comes as GIS files, and that needs to be converted into, into CAD files um, or other types of GIS files for, for other people to use. And then, as GIS folk, we have an important task of making sure that data is fit for purpose. Often we are the first um, sort of instigators of data on a project. People come to us saying, um, we've got this project, we need to see some land parcels, or we need some roads for this area, can you get it? And of course we go off and see what's available, and uh, we need to assess that data, is it fit for purpose? Um, there's often geometry errors in, in data, there's little loops or intersections that shouldn't be there. There might be attributes missing. We need to know all the street names, but half of them are missing. Um, things like topology errors, donut holes, or null values. These are things that we need to assess, say, is this data fit for purpose? Um, and try and clean it up if, if, if we need to, and if we can. And of course, this doesn't just go for data that we, we're getting off the internet. This can go for data that is coming from external contractors. Um, maybe sub-consultants or um, colleagues who've gone out into the field to pick data up. And we have the important task of checking that this data is, is good um, for use on the project. And then another thing that we do regularly is look at changes to data. So this can be from um, you go on vacation for a week and you come back and uh, you've discovered that the intern has uh, has gotten to your database and didn't really know what they were doing and, and messed everything up. Um, it could also be that you've just got changes that are regularly happening to your data. You've, you've obviously making copies of it, but you want to look uh, month on month um, what changes have actually occurred to that data. Now, all these tasks are things that we do on a sort of routine daily basis um, as GIS professionals. And of course, all this stuff can be done manually. So you can you can click, you can receive some data, you can go through and click and say, right, let me look at the attributes, let me look at the attribute names. Do these attribute names match um, what I expect them to match? Um, let me run some geometry checkers to check there's no dodgy geometry in here. And of course, if you've just got one, one file that's come in, it's, it's quite quick to do that, especially if it's a small file. But if you are starting to do that um, repetitively, it can take quite a long time and this is a great graph um, that, um, that I came across, and it describes the, um, the geek method versus the non-geek method. And I'm going to put my hand up here and say that I, I definitely classify myself as a geek. I love automating things. I don't like doing things manually. And the geek method, and I can relate to this quite highly, and I'm sure a lot of you can as well, you do it manually, um, and you might do it, if you have to do it once and it's short, you do it manually. You do it twice and you start to think, I really don't want to do this again. You have to do it 50 times and you think, no way, no way am I doing this manually. And you get annoyed and you write a script to automate it. And then you can go off and uh, get grab a cup of coffee or go and, do, go and do a more interesting task and get on with your day. The non-geek method is just to keep on repeat, repetitively doing it manually. Um, now, one thing that we do tend to do is overestimate the amount of time that it takes to write a script and possibly underestimate the time that it takes that you gain by, um, um, by writing that script or the time that you lose by not writing that script. And especially, I think this is especially true when, you, when you're new to automating. So if you are, um, haven't used FME for very long, and you are still kind of overwhelmed by all the transformers that are in FME, um, don't get put off by sort of overestimating the time it takes to write the script to write the model to automate. Because, um, well, practice makes perfect, and it, it, it saves such a huge amount of time, um, as I'll go into later, later in this talk. Now, this is a fantastic um, picture um, that I came across um, that shows how much time you can spend working on a task before you start spending more time than you gain by automation. Now this has come from a cartoon series called XKCD, 
Um, I've got the address of this particular cartoon at the bottom there, and I can highly recommend, if you've never come across this um, cartoon series, to go and take a look at the website. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. But um, just be warned that you might want a few hours to waste of your life before you go there, because um, there's a lot of a lot of a lot of cartoons there. Um, but what this is showing is um, on the the x-axis is how often do you do the task. So if you are doing a task daily, and by automating that task, um, you will save 30 minutes. So 30 minutes a day, you spend doing something in particular. And you can you write a model that will save you 30 minutes of that day, um, out of that day by doing that task. Over five years, you can spend five weeks perfecting that that model before you're spending more time on it than you save. So if you take that down to a year, because obviously five years is a, is a long time, you can spend a week um, creating that model that will save you 30 minutes a day. And often things take a lot less than, you know, take an hour or two to actually automate. Again, it takes a lot less time than you think most of the time. So, Dale, just before I move on to the next section, I was just wondering if any questions have come in. Thanks, Kate. Yes, um, I just wanted to, first of all, comment that I think that chart on the previous slide is absolutely crucial for folks to understand. It, it is really astonishing if, if you think about it, if you can do something that even saves you one second, but you're doing it 50 times a day, what what the impact that will have. Now, practically with FME, you're, you're typically down in the, um, the further to the, the bottom things where you do things that, that can save you know, hours. Uh, and then if that happens over and over again, it's worth investing in that upfront time. But actually, in terms of the questions from the audience so far, um, they, uh, they really want to have uh, these slides afterwards. They love the uh, geek and no geek slides. Um, so they, uh, they will want to see those. And I think, uh, Kate, are we able to share those afterwards? I believe we can. Uh, yes, that should be fine. Yeah, and this one here from the XKCD, you've got the URL for it as well, uh, everybody at home. Uh, the only other question that came in was asking uh, just in general, what databases do you use uh, with FME, Kate? Um, so I use SQL Server a lot. Um, I, I really like SQL Server. Um, my colleagues tend to use Postgres more. Um, yeah. on their projects. And then, of course, we use Esri geodatabases as well. Right. So the, within the Esri family, of course, there's a whole bunch of uh, database things. And um, now, in your organization, do you make use of, of Oracle? Uh, not so much, no. Um, okay. Oracle, not, not from a GIS point of view. Right, right. Uh, but anyway, so FME, of course, can support Oracle. And then uh, what about things like SQLite, like these sort of um, small um, single user databases. Do you ever make use of those temporarily, SQLite or Spatialite? Uh, no, we don't use those because we've got um, SQL Server set up and we've got Postgres. And obviously Postgres is fantastic because it's open source and it can actually yes. give the spatial data. To, 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 it's the best database out there and it's completely free. Um, those are the yeah. ones we tend to go with. And the other question is, uh, is there, if we're using SME with databases, is there much difference from one database to the next? Um, no, not that I found. It, it connects in, you know, you just, you, you, you build that connection in. And the, the newer, um, the latest versions of FME are great because they remember your connection parameters. And then it's just like working with, with any other data source, really. Yes. Um, someone asked about MongoDB, and I can mention that FME does not support that right now, but we're going to um, within the next few months. Uh, have you ever heard of MongoDB being used? Um, it's not something that I've personally used. Um, I have heard of it, but I've, I don't know much about it. Right. I think that that's, there, there are a set of these sort of um, NoSQL JSON-based uh, unstructured databases, and I know that uh, Microsoft has one called DocumentDB, um, Elasticsearch would be in this category. Many of these have spatial things in them too, and, um, and FME can support them all. And so the kind of things that Kate's going to talk about would apply to all those as well. Um, one other person said that they think that documenting business logic is a big time saver. And in your experience, Kate, how does, how does the documentation aspect often play into these workflows? Um, so do you, mind, do you mind just expanding on that question? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I guess, can the workflows you create be used to explain to others 
what the business logic is. So um, by, uh, oftentimes people can draw the data flows and then that becomes a tool for explaining the business logic to other, other people. Oh yes, for sure. I mean, especially on our really large projects, um, we set up FME models to handle all sorts of data flows um, and this is something that becomes integral to the project. So every time an update is made, so for example, um, if a alignment is being designed for a road or a railway, um, these will go through many, many, many iterations and sort of changing almost on a daily basis as, as you know, as new things crop up and the, the alignment needs to change. And um, FME is instrumental in, in sort of processing that data and getting it into usable formats to then go out to the clients and to, to subcontractors and everyone else who needs to assess this. So it becomes very really important in the, in the sort of the business flow of, of that data. Yes, yes. And actually the, the customer that or the attendee at SASNet points out that um, sometimes a lot of time is wasted when people don't know what their outcome is wanting to be. So having a clear requirement um, is sort of an ingredient for saving time in the long run as well. And I know, Kate, in your situation, the requirements, at least the ones that, that you've shown me, tend to be fairly clear, but I can I understand that some people, sometimes it's foggy and that's where you could waste a lot of time. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, lastly, folks are asking about Amazon things. Um, certainly FME can work with Amazon DynamoDB and things like S3, which isn't really a database but a file store. In your environment, are you making use of cloud services very much or is that something that's still on the future horizon? It's still mostly on the future horizon. We do use them sometimes, but our IT gets very nervous when we, when we work in the cloud. Right. So we, we tend to work more on our own servers. Okay, so uh, with that, why don't we uh, go back to your, uh, your slides. Okay, fantastic. Right, so moving on to the three time-saving examples. So I'm going to talk about um, projections um, and then followed by conversions and then finally just on sort of good old-fashioned getting data usable. So beginning with projections. So I find in, in my capacity here that a lot of people that I work with don't really understand projections very well. And they are quite happy to use data just sort of as it comes. Um, and only start to worry when they get some new data that doesn't necessarily line up with their, their current data. So we need to, as again, as GIS people, we need to make sure that um, a coordinate system, a correct coordinate system is set um, and that people are working in the right in the right units in the right coordinate system. And I find a really good way to explain to people about projections is to open something like ArcMap, and bring in a base map, and just start flipping between the different coordinate systems to show people how much it changes. So at the top here, I've got obviously um, WGS84, which is in degrees, and uh, from minus 180 to 180, or minus 90 to 90. This next uh, projection is California State Plain Zone 3. And you can see how much it distorts the world because this is only set up to, um, to work in a very, very small part of San Francisco. Um, sorry, it's a very small part of California, which is basically around the San Francisco area. And the coordinates uh, tend to be in, in feet, in fact, in US feet, which is slightly different to international feet. And you've got coordinates that are ranging in the hundred thousands to the, to the millions. And then finally here, um, you have British National Grid, which again shows the world in a completely different way. You lose the Americas and you lose, um, you lose everything east of, of Eastern Europe. And uh, the numbers here are in the, in the hundred thousands and are in meters. And it's really important, I mean, if, if, you, if you get it wrong, your data will be completely distorted and it might not even appear. So, for, for example, I had a colleague, this was a few years ago, who contacted me saying that their data looked really odd and could I, could I take a look at it? And I asked him, so he showed me the date, and I said, oh, yeah, that does look really, really odd. It was very skewed and, and not really matching up to anything else. And I said, oh, what, what coordinate system are you using? And he said, oh, I'm using British National Grid. And I was like, oh, where's, where's the project? And he said, oh, Eastern Europe. So, of course, the data wasn't, wasn't was looking very, very odd because um, he wasn't using the right coordinate system for the country that he was in. So this is where something like FME is fantastic because we don't tend to, unless you're very lucky and you live in a country where there is only one coordinate system that tends to be used. So for example, in the UK, British National Grid is standard across the whole country. 
um, LSUN in Ireland, Ireland and Northern Ireland, and these Irish national grid. Um, but here in the US, it's a huge country, and there's there's hundreds of different coordinate systems that are that are in use. Um, each state has its own state plane zone, and that's split up into different. Sorry, each state plane. Each state has its own state plane coordinate system, and each state is split up into multiple zones. So I'm going to show you an example here where um, we had a project that was being done in uh, UTM. So um, it was a metric projection, but here in the States, um, an early decision was made that this project would be would be metric. And then sort of after the project got started, a lot of files have been created, a decision was made that it should actually be moved into a, a US feet-based unit um, in the state plane coordinate system. And obviously, um, this is if the project's already started, there's a lot of files, everything's been set up in the right coordinate system. Uh, this is where the power of FME really comes in handy to um, to convert. So I'm just going to jump over to the workspace. It should be that one. No, it's not that one. Just bear with me for a second. They've gone back to front. Had it set up so they're all in order earlier, but uh, yeah, they're definitely all back to front. So it is that one that I want. Right. So what this workspace is doing is it's taking in the DGNs that have been um, that have been created for the project uh, that have been created in the UTM, and it's converting them into the correct state plane zone. Now, obviously, this could be a, a very straightforward transformer. If you just have input data, you put a um, a reprojector and you put the output. But what made this a little bit more complicated was that this was a um, a, linear, a long linear project, so this is a, a railway line that was being designed that um, covered three different state plane zones. So it not only needed to be converted into the right coordinate system, different bits of the alignment and the different bits of the files, and so all the background files like roads and, and uh, boundary files and things like that, had to be then reprojected into the correct state plane zone depending on where in the state it fell. So the first thing I've got here, these are the DGNs uh, coming in on the on the on the left here, and um, they're all going to an arc stroker. And I'll go into this arc stroker a little bit more, but this is something that's really important if you're ever working with microstation files. Um, first thing you should always do is um, push it into an arc stroker. And as I say, I'll go into a little, that a little bit more, and when I'm back on my slides, and then. The bit that I've skipped there, that's basically just doing some um, some clipping work. Um, it's taking the basically taking the state plane boundaries in from a shape file. It clips the the right bits of the DGNs into the right um, areas, and then it's doing your projection at the end here. So once the clip has happened, it's now got um, an attribute associated with that, which is associated with the zone that is in. So zone two then gets pushed, and that's the north central zone and it reprojects it into the right area. String concatenator is just giving it um, the correct name for output, and it outputs the DGN um, back into a new DGN with all the same levels. And then likewise, this is the central zone and the south central zone that's going down. Now, the fantastic thing about this workspace is that it's generic. So if we had 100 DGNs that we needed to, to sort out, um, once this workspace has been set up, it's just a case of pushing it through. And you can go off and make a cup of coffee, and by the time you come back, it's probably all done and all ready to go, and the engineers can carry on with their work. If you were to do this manually, it's probably going to take you, um, well, if you were to do it in ArcGIS, for example, and you did what you did, well, you couldn't do it in ArcGIS very easily because you'd have to convert everything out of DGN and into, into Shapefile and back in, which would cause a whole nightmare of problems. So you'd probably have to look at doing it within MicroStation. Um, and again, I'm not entirely sure how long it would, it would take. It would certainly take a very, very long time and be a very complicated operation. Whereas with FME and automation, it's you know an, an hour or so to set up something like this, and then a few minutes to run, and you're ready to go. Right. So before I move on to the next section, Dale, I was just wondering if there's any questions that have come in. Yes. Uh well, one observant uh, user 
uh, noticed, our customer attendee, and noticed the fancy panning and zooming you were doing in there. Can you just hop back to uh, Workbench? And uh, if some of you are longtime FME customers, you won't have seen that before. That's uh, a new thing that's in FME 2016, which Kate is the first one to ever show. And that is um, this ability to kind of pan between different bookmarks. So it just is a way of um, presenting workspaces that we've added. And you have to add that onto your toolbar. We'll be rolling this out as part of FME 2016. Uh, so anyway, that's what that is. Uh, um, if you want to go back to the first one, somebody asked, what's with that all business on the, on the left-hand side there um, from your first bookmark? So that all, what does that actually mean? Uh, it means that I've just selected a whole bunch of DGNs to come in here. Um, and they all are going to come in that one place. All the levels, all the data, everything comes in in one place right there. Yes. So I've just, um, when, I, when I selected it, I um, would have, um, what's the button? It's the one where you, you bring it as an individual, you bring it in as groups. I would have brought it in as groups so rather than having lots and lots of DGNs. I then have to manually link up. I just bring it in looking like one DGN, but it's actually split up by um, the FME base name. You're right. And so um, the other thing that uh, is worth pointing out is that often you can use wildcards to pull all the DGNs, for example, from a single directory. So when you go in FME to um, specify the input, you can say something like star.dgn. Do you, do you do that sometimes and use wildcards? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, it's very useful. Yes. And so the other thing about this workspace was that you're, you're determining the zone by basically clipping. The clipping, you, you must be bringing, bringing in the zone boundaries and clipping um, based on that. Yes, that's correct. So I've got the zone boundaries that are coming in here, and then I'm clipping yes. over here. Yes. So then after we're clipping, each of the pieces of the original D DGN file knows the zone it's supposed to be in, and that's when you fork out in that last part to then do the, do the right conversion. And as you point out, this doesn't really have anything specific about any particular DGN, like any, any DGN file that you'd come across could be used in this way. Exactly, and I'm pushing it out into dynamic um, output here, so all well, the levels from the original DGN will go through to the output DGN. Yes. Um, someone uh, asked if you ever use local coordinate systems in your engineering projects and how you deal with that. Um, we do sometimes. Um, it's actually very rare that we use local coordinate systems. Um, you then have to set up a, um, it depends on how the, a few times I have used it, it's usually actually been on a conversion based on a standard coordinate system. So it's a mathematical conversion that you can just put in. Um, if it's something more complex than that, obviously then you need to get all the coordinate parameters, uh, projection parameters, and, and sort of add it in. Um, as a file that can then be read. Right. Uh, I think um, in this particular, they've just written some more that they um, sometimes use these equal areas. Sometimes I know that um, even FME has some transformers for making uh, temporary local coordinate systems based on ASMED, I think, azimuth equal area. And sometimes people do that, but as you point out, it's really crucial if that's what's happening, that those parameters are well documented um, and then they can be pulled back in and, and used. Yeah, because otherwise, um, I mean, there's, there's always a game that I, that I find where with, with, um, with data, sometimes it comes in and you play a game called Guess the Coordinate System and you just hope that it's, it's one of the existing coordinate systems in the world and not, not some, something someone's made up without actually documenting. Yes, I still remember um, when if, if uh, I had a Map Info customer once call me, and they they in their whole lives because Map Info has a strong uh, built-in coordinate system concept, they said, um, "Well, you're you're not reading the coordinate system out of this uh, CAD file, the DWG file." And I say, "Well, what do you mean?" In their world model, they had never heard of a, a spatial file that didn't have a coordinate system because from Map Info background, that always was there. And so it took a little while till the person was able to realize that the DWG file didn't have a coordinate system. And I, you know, no, I'm sorry, there, there isn't one in there. You, we're not, it's not that we're not reading it, there just isn't one. And they said to me, well, this is going to be a big problem. And um, that often is the case with some of these uh, CAD files. If you don't know the coordinate system, then you do have some work ahead of you. And, um, but that's more of a uh, documentation and requirements uh, thing for the CAD people in your environment to be using. Um, 
lastly, uh, someone's asking if you ever do reprojection on rasters. Do you, do you reproject rasters? Uh, yes, I do. And, and is the technique basically very similar or, or nearly identical to this? Oh, yeah. It's, it's absolutely identical. Um, you just make sure that the, the input coordinate system is set and you, um, you can clip it if you want, um, if, it's, if it needs to go into different coordinate systems, or you just um, push it straight through into reprojector and out the other side. Right. Um, absolutely identical. Yes. Yeah, so the rasters are, um, there's lots of raster operations actually in FME, and one of them is um, coordinate systems. And I doubt if you've ever used HDF4 files, have you? No. Uh, I know that FME supports these. I personally have not either. Um, so, but but nonetheless, uh, that that can be done. Um, someone is suggesting if you are asking if you've ever in your output when you're making your output file names, if you've ever um, concatenated the name of the coordinate system into those. And I, I guess the um, like data set fan out, which is a concept in FME, could be used to dynamically make output file names. And I suppose one could put the coordinate system in there. But have you ever done that, Kate? Um, well, yes, actually. Um, not not the full name, but like, well, that's, that's what's happening in this um, particular area here. Is that for this particular project, because we're working with three coordinate systems, um, yes. we've got a code at the end which is ZNC, ZC, or ZSC, which goes onto the end of any file that's been created, whether in GIS or CAD, so that we know straight away which coordinate system it's in. And um, that's what the string concatenator is doing: is taking the the base name of the the DGN that's coming in, and um, Putting that coordinate system at the at the end. Um, I so see. So, so you are, yeah, yeah, and that and then that's being used to create the output um, file name. Yes. Excellent. Let's see. So um, some people are asking about conflating attributes. I think we'll take that one offline. Oh, someone's asking what's the difference between the CS map reprojector and this one. I think the CS map reprojector gives you some more um, options with respect to vertical datum conversion. Do you ever do that? Do you run into vertical datum issues in your work, Kate? Um, not very often. Um, we do sometimes with older data that might be in the, the 1929 vertical datum, but um, it's not something I've really worked with much other than sort of helping people um, determine which, which vertical datum they're working in. Right. Oh, now someone else asks, uh, why is it that you did decide to stroke the arcs? Did you, do you find that if you don't stroke them, you get poorer results on later on? Or what, what is the main reason for getting rid of the arcs early? Um, because if you don't stroke them, um, it, looks, it, it basically comes out um, angular rather than curved. And I'll go back into, I go into this a bit later, actually, in the presentation. I've got a little okay. diagram that tries to show this. So um, hopefully okay. I'll be able to answer the question better then. All right. And um, lastly, uh, I don't know that, that I personally have a good answer here, but she, there's someone asking, how, how would you suggest CAD people um, document their projections? So um, is, in, your, in your experience, what's the best way to make sure that when you get a CAD file that your organization has made sure that somebody has captured the projection? Um, well, it depends on the project. So for something like this project, we have ensured that every CAD file that's get, get, that gets created has the projection code on the end. And this is a code we've just set up for the project. Um, obviously, if it's coming external from, from an external source, you can't do that. Um, but you can obviously go back and, and ask them what, what the coordinate system is, or, or you dictate which coordinate system they should be using. So for example, sometimes when we're working with external consultants, we'll send them out a base CAD file in the right coordinate system um, and say that they need to work off that and make sure their data lines up with that. Okay. It's, it's, it's a very tricky problem. Um, often CAD files can come in um, and you don't really know where it is. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, I think with that we should um, head back to the, uh, to, the, to the next section. Right, fantastic. So moving on to conversions. Um, so I know this is true for myself, and I'm, I'm probably sure this is true for a lot of you on the, on the webinar today. Um, I started using FME um, as a conversion tool. Um, and then sort of grew from there into just discovering all the other amazing things that FME can do. Um, because we, again, we are the people, being the GIS people, that uh, we get data 
and somebody says, can you put this into something that I can use in my software? And I started, I think back in the day, um, I was working in the UK and we used to get a lot of map info files. And obviously you cannot bring a map info file into, into ArcGIS and uh, the load map info to, to ArcGIS conversions. So this is what FME is truly great at, especially when, you, when you're starting out with FME, because it's really simple. You bring in, um, you bring in a shapefile, for example, on the left there, and you want to put it into something else. Uh, you just basically connect it up. So in this case, taking a shapefile into a KML uh, to show on Google Earth, and um, Whenever you're taking something into Google Earth, the, the two transformers you should always use um, at a minimum are the KML styler and the KML property setter. So the styler sets up things like your, your icons and line colors, and your property setter sets up your um, HTML output in the, in the box you know, that, that pops up. Um, and you run that, and again, Bob's your uncle. It's, it's really quick, very easy, and you have a lovely KML that, um, that you can look at in Google Earth. But of course, um, you can do something a bit more complicated with the data as well. So this is doing a conversion as well. This is going from um, ArcGIS um, shapefile format into, into a CAD format. And um, I'm just going to jump it back to the workbench. There we go. So in this particular case, this was the same project where the data needed to go into three different zones, depending where um, whereabouts in the state the, um, the data was. And so what we've got here on the, the left is the data, incoming data. So we've got the state plane zones, which are used purely for the clipping function. Um, in this case, we have roads data, which has come from um, GIS. And then we have the alignment data up here, which is the, the CAD files. So this is the design files of the, um, of the railway alignment. And this railway alignment um, stretches over, over a few hundred miles. So it's, it's, it's very long. Now, the GIS data um, covered the entire state. So it's a huge amount of data. And within, when we're working in FME, or working in ArcGIS or QGIS, um, we can handle huge amounts of data. You can bring an entire state, um, state's worth of roads and still have your computer function and do things. However, if you were to convert an entire state's worth of roads into um, a CAD file, um, it would, it might not open. Um, it, it, it probably won't open. Um, if it does open, it will slow the, the, the software down to such a speed that it will be impractical to work with. So one thing that we do when we're converting GIS data into, into CAD is cut it down to the areas that they, they actually need. Because any more um, just, just slows down the software too much. So what this is doing is um, just doing a, a very simple buffer and clip operation. So it's taking in the alignment files. It's uh, aggregating them into, into one. And then um, clipping based on um, based on a buffer amount. So in this case, I probably put something like um, 5,000 meters, or sorry, 5,000 feet either side of the alignment, um, which is sort of just under a mile, and uh, brought the roadways in and clipped it. So suddenly the, the, the data that's going through into CAD is a lot less dense and a lot more usable. And then it's clearly a case of um, it goes through, it's just doing, um, doing some setting up operations to get the data exactly how I want it. And then in this case, because again, we needed it to go into, into three state plane zones, um, the data, obviously if you're getting statewide data, it comes in one zone, it's probably um, either a, a, a projection that covers the entire state, or it's in, um, in NAD83, which is a common lat long format here in the US. Um, and so that data, once it's clipped, it needs to be projected into the right um, into the right zone, which is what's happening here. And then, because I was taking it into a DGN, I needed to do a little bit of work with that, um, just to get it to look right in the DGN, because it wasn't coming from DGN to DGN like the last um, workbench that I showed you. It was coming from Shapefile into DGN. And so um, there's two pathways here. There's one that um, just takes the line work 
I'm creating an attribute creator, which is just creating a level name for it to go out. And um, that then pushes through. The string concatenator is just putting that um, the zone name at the end of it and pushing it through to a DGN. Um, at the top here, this is a separate pathway that's coming from that same data. And that's because I wanted a labels layer in the data as well. So I was, I was giving the, the CAD folk um, road data. Obviously, road data is, is lovely with the line work, but names make it a lot more useful. So the labeler is just pulling out um, attributes um, from the shapefile with the road name and um, then creating it as a label in the CAD file. And I've just created a labels um, level there for it to go in. And that then pushes through into, um, into the DGN output. Right, so jumping back to the presentation. Right, so here are the good to knows um, with working with DGNs and um, with the arc stroker. So I've got here on the right a, um, an example of what's going on when you bring a DGN into, um, into FME. Now, a lot of DGNs um, will contain arcs. And if you zoom really close into that arc, um, it basically gets, it basically looks like a straight line. And if you convert it without using an arc stroker, what will happen is it will, it will look very gritty as it goes round because it's, it's straight lines rather than a curve. And if you put the arc stroker in, you put the maximum deviation and you set it to a very minuscule amount. I've got there at the moment um, 0 0.001. I actually normally go smaller when I'm, when I'm working with this in a workbench. I'll put in more zeros before that one. And what it does is it takes that, sort of the, the way it reads it in, it gets it as close as it possibly can to the original arc. So if the original arc there is the green line on the right, um, if you don't use the arc stroker, you get um, that line on the left. And as you increase the maximum deviation, this blue line will get further away from the red and closer to the green. Now, I've shown here, this is sort of for exaggeration purposes, so you can see what's going on. But um, if you if you just do a test on a DGN that you have um, that you have lying around, um, if you don't use an arc stroker, you can actually see very clearly by eye that something something has gone wrong. You, if you convert it into a KML or you convert it into a shape file and you bring it into ArcGIS with the, with the background map or you take it into Google Earth, and especially if it's something like a road, you can see that it 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 sort of creates um, it's off where it should be and it's really noticeable. Um, if you use the arc stroker, you, you cannot tell by eye. Um, it's especially with your maximum deviation set to a tiny number. Um, it 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 basically comes through perfectly. So it's like the number one rule with working with DGNs is just put it through an arc stroker. Even if they um, supposedly no arcs in there, chances are there are some, and it's just a really good habit to get into. And I guess um, the second thing is um, that by explicitly putting in an arc stroker, you get to control that deviation. FME by itself will stroke, but the, we'll, we'll make our best guess. But by you taking control here, you can, you can exactly get the deviation that you, you want. Exactly. And it, it really does. I can't stress how much of a big difference it makes. So, uh, yes, yeah, my, 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 I guess my, my biggest tip with working with DGNs and, and FME. And then um, the second one is um, always linking to a seed file. And um, this is something I actually didn't realize at first um, when I first started using FME. And I'd, I'd output things to DGN, and it would just, what, what happens if you don't use a seed file is you open up the DGN that you've created, and it looks, it looks wonderful, and it looks right, and the numbers seem right. But as soon as you try and bring it into another DGN, um, the data will, will be very odd. It will appear way off, and it won't, it won't line up. And um, I, I couldn't figure this out, and uh, I would end up just using DWGs, converting it to DWGs, and sending it to the CAD folk who then convert it from DWG into DGN. And uh, then somebody one day told me about the seed file parameter, and again, it makes a world of difference. So the seed file um, has the, the units set up for the project in it, um, and when you're creating a DGN, um, it looks at the seed file and it's, it sets up your DGN that you're creating in FME to the project standards of your particular project. And um, then your, your data will work spot on. So again, really, really important. It's the first thing I do if somebody says, can you create a DGN for me from this data? And it's a project that I've not necessarily been working on. I say, can you please send me a seed file? Um, 
So really, really important. Um, so those are my, yeah, my, I guess, my two biggest tips for working with DGNs in, in FME. And then the final conversion I wanted to show you is on photographs. So people go out onto site. Um, they're taking lots of photos. Hopefully, um, you can convince people who are going out on site to use um, a GPS camera. Or again, a lot of people these days just use their, their mobile phones. Um, and if people are using their phones, as long as the GPS is turned on, all your photos are being geotagged. And this is really useful because people come back into the office. Um, if they've taken, they've gone out and taken site uh, photos of, of sort of lots of manhole covers or um, sort of different bits of a muddy field, um, all the photos tend to look the same after a while, and it's very hard to remember where where you took which photo. Um, so as long as the GPS is turned on, obviously you can then geo um, Georeference all these photos and, and put them into um, put them into something like Google Earth or um, into ArcGIS or whatever other software um, you want to use. So this is a really simple um, little workbench that um, there we go. That's the one I want to look at. That um, takes in the input photos. You can see that you've got the all over there again. And basically, what this is doing is just taking and um, reading in all the photos within a folder. Um, this is a custom transformer that somebody's created very kindly and put it on the FME store um, so that you can just go and go and download it. That pulls out the, the GPS coordinates and basically georeferences um, or ge geolocates, sorry, um, that photo. And there's a port here for no GPS, so that's if, if no GPS coordinates are found, either the GPS wasn't turned on or there was no GPS taken or just didn't find the signal for that particular photo, um, it would output through there. So you could always put an inspector through there to see how many photos are, are not, not geotagged. And then in this case, I set up the rules for the output name and for the, um, the names that went into the HTML pop-up. So this was going into, into Google Earth. Um, so it's just setting up the rules for for um, for the name of the KML file that will be created, and I base that on the folder name that the photos were placed in. Because often people come back, they put the photos on the network somewhere, and they'll go, they might date the folder and go, um, you know, site visit 2015-1103, um, or site visit um, and the name of the place that they went to and the date. So I'm just creating a KML with that, that exact folder uh, folder name um, for easy reference later on. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, going through into the KML styler and the KML property setter, which sets up your look and feel of your output KML. And then it's just pushing it through into the, into the, into the output. And what you get from that is um, a KML file that has the photo embedded in it. And um, in, in this case, I've put in the image direction and the, the image date and time that that photo was taken. And what I love about a workbench like that is that it's completely irrelevant to the project that you're working on. It can be set up and used on any project. It's, it's basically as long as you've got um, geotagged photos, geotagged photographs, um, you can use it anywhere uh, for any project. And again, a massive time saver and really, really useful. I mean, for, for people who are going out in the field and coming back and looking at these at, at their photos, um, it can bring back um, a lot of memories um, in terms of what, where they were on site when they took a particular photo. So Dale, I see we're starting to run a bit short on time. But before I get on to the last section, I was just wondering if there's any more questions. Yes, we are getting a bit tight. I'll quickly um, mention. Um, Someone asked, do you ever use the Esri reprojector? Uh, no, very rarely. I have yes, used it, that, but, but not very often. I think that the key reason there would be if you want to use specific Esri datum shift techniques. But in general, um, I would agree that unless you're doing that, then the traditional reprojectors are probably fine. Um, someone asked if you use the clippers first. We have, you often are using um, data coming from another file to do your clipping. Uh, I think if you set your, your transformer for the clipper to say the clippers are coming first, that can have a speed improvement. Do you tend to do that? Um, it really depends. Um, not very often because 
I find that um, often these, these workbenches run pretty quickly anyway, so I don't need to do much right. fine tuning. Obviously, yeah. if a workbench is taking an hour to run, then I'd start looking into things like that to speed it up. Yes. Okay. And I think with that, we should let you get on to the last section here, which is quite uh, worthwhile. Great. So yeah, this last section is just on good old-fashioned getting data usable. So this is an example that I really like because it uses a mixture of ArcGIS, um, Python, and FME to get the end result. Now, what, what can happen is if you've got a, um, a web service, if you're using ArcGIS, you've got a web service coming in with, with background data, and you want to take that data and put it into, um, into, ArcGIS, sorry, into um, a CAD format, um, you need to get that data out. Now, obviously, um, you need to check the, the legal requirements of this um, to make sure the, the data that you're using can do, because not all web services will allow you to do this. But something like OpenStreetMap is a really good example of, of data you can use this on. Now, in ArcGIS, if you open up, um, if you're in the global view, you can go File, Export, and you can export your, your background um, with a world file. And that, you know, you can then take into a CAD, in, into a CAD format. But um, if you've got a long alignment or a big area, you're going to be there for hours sort of panning, exporting, panning, exporting, and it's, it's not very exciting, and you're probably going to miss some areas. So what you can do within Esri is set up um, data-driven pages. You set up a grid along basically with the areas that you want to export. Um, you can um, take it into a layout view. You set up data-driven pages um, focusing on the center of each of that grid that you've set up. Um, save that MXD. And then there's this Python code at the bottom. And this is this is available on the, on the internet if you just um, go searching for it. Um, and basically what it does is it takes your MXD and it goes to each data-driven page and it exports um, it exports whatever's on that page into a geo-referenced um, TIFF. So if you've got sort of 100 or a couple of hundred Im images that you want to export, this is a fantastic way to do it. But what you'll end up with at the end of the day is a, um, a huge area that um, a huge, with a huge amount of data. So each of the TIFFs that it exports are around 150 megs. Now, this is where FME comes in handy, because you've got all this data, and if you've, you've done it for a huge area, you might actually only want, um, at that particular point in time, a small area. The CAD folk only want to bring a small area into the, into the CAD product. Um, so if I jump to here. So what this is doing is, again, it's reading in the geotiffs, and we're reading all the geotiffs um, that, you've, that you've created. And this is a straight conversion into a reduced size JPEG, so it's just just connected up. And within the JPEG, obviously you say yes, you want a world file because the um, if you're taking it into MicroStation or AutoCAD, the world file is needed. And you set your compression level, and it will take this 150 meg file down to about four or five megs, which will make your IT people a lot happier um, without any um, visible loss in resolution of the data. So again, a really, really useful way of, if you've got huge, huge TIFFs, um, convert them into JPEGs and make them a lot smaller, and then you can put your TIFFs onto a, um, you know, onto a, um, a hard drive um, off, off, off the network. And then we're using here the raster extents coercer, which um, basically just creates your outline of the grid. And I'm pushing it both into shapefile and into DGN. Um, the shapefile, obviously, you can take your, your base name, which is the name of each aerial creates an attribute of it. Within the DGN is creating that grid. And then I use a label point replacer on the base name. And what that does is it takes the base name, so basically the name of the aerial, and puts it as a label in the center of each tile. So when um, a CAD person opens up that DGN, they'll get a grid with all the names of the aerials in the center of each, each tile. And they go, right, I'm focusing on this area. These are the four that I want to bring in. And then the, the final one I wanted to show you, and I see we are running tight on time, so I'll go very quickly through this, um, is just on, um, this, so this is a database example for those of you asking database questions earlier, um, taking CSVs into SQL Server. Um, in this case, I, I want to speak about the Workspace Runner for those of you who haven't used it, but it's, it's a really, I'll just really, really quickly mention it. It's a really useful tool. Um, in our case, with this project, we had 
thousands upon thousands upon thousands of CSVs with over one and a half billion rows of data. Um, and you cannot run that all into one FME model at one time, because it'll just crash your computer. Um, because they were separated into separate folders, I could run a folder at a time and then use a workspace runner to work run the workspace. And this meant that a folder at a time could be run, but I could leave it running overnight and it would just run folder after folder. So if I jump to, sorry, I keep seeing things to miss it. There we go. So in this particular case, we had these thousands of CSVs, but they were incredibly, incredibly messy. So um, the first thing I needed to do was start sorting out the CSV as they came in. Um, we had data that was within one column that should have been split out. And um, that was what the CSV sorter does. It's just going through the attributes and substrings to get the data into a format that we needed. Not all CSVs are created equal. We had different types of CSVs doing different types of things. Um, we obviously wanted them all to do the same thing. So I was using a tester there just to kind of see what type of CSV was coming in. And in this particular case, um, I think I had different attribute names. So I had to rename the attributes if they didn't conform to the standards that I wanted. I then used a custom transformer up here, which is a which basically provided um, lookups to determine um, what sort of categories my data should go into. And this was something specific to what I was doing. So I had a whole bunch of categories coming in, and I wanted to classify them into five distinct categories rather than the hundreds of that that were coming in. And then what I like to call the chicken and egg output, because I had these thousands of CSVs, I couldn't, um, and they were some of them were diff different to the others, I couldn't test for all of them and to test all the scenarios that were coming in. So I ran a few thousand at first to get an idea, but then because I knew I was going to miss some, I did an attribute filter, and this is where, um, this was something that came out of my custom transformer where if it didn't conform to the types that I had realized, it would then push out into a new CSV, um, which is basically an error CSV at the end here, that I could then go and look at afterwards and then rerun through, um, fixing, um, basically fixing my workbench so that they would be picked up as well. And then uh, finally, the output. Um, and this is going into a database here. So this is a SQL Server database that was sitting on our, that sits, um, sits in our network. Um, the string replaces are just setting up the data so that it's um, going into the format that I expect. And then it pushed through. And as I say, we ran about one and a half billion rows of, of, of data through here and into the database. Um, and again, because the CSVs were in, in such a mess, I don't know how we would have done it without FME. We would have had to do some sort of coding. So, you know, we would have had to use a Python script or something like that if FME wasn't available to do this. There's no way we could have we could have done this manually or, or set it up um, just to read straight in. So the very last thing I, I want to um, say today is um, just to give an example of, of a project that I've worked on that really where, where automation has really saved a lot of time. And in this case, it was for an airport where um, the airport engineers, when they're designing, when they're designing an airport or um, looking at, at extending runways or moving runways or whatever they're doing, they obviously need to look at the 3D airspace that goes out from that particular, um, particular runway. And they use their software to do this. They design the, um, these darker lines that are going around, which um, have, have vertical um, heights associated with them. And this is obviously a very technical um, procedure. It has to follow um, standard regulations. But then they need to contour the insides. And so these, basically, these lines in here are just standard contours. But the software that they were using, they couldn't do this automatically. So they designed these lines, and then some poor CAD technician would have to go through and create all these um, inside lines, which is obviously a, a pretty dull and time-consuming job. And one of the, the airport engineers came to me one day and said, oh, we heard you've got this software that you can do cool stuff with. Um, could you please take a, you know, could you take a look at our problem and see if you can, if you can make our life a bit easier? And of course, I said, sure. And I created a workbench, it's very simple, um, just looks like this. Um, but what it does is it, it took in their, their lines, it's basically just running a contour, sets up some rules for output names, and pushes it out. But what I really love about this is that 
when they were designing um, these, these particular designs, they have to design a, number, design a number of iterations depending on for different aircraft and things like that. Um, it would take about eight hours of work to do um, sort of one, you know, um, a, a typical sort of a typical design that they came up with. Um, this workbench will run all of those in about 20 seconds. So it really has taken a day's worth of work into something that's not even a, an issue anymore, um, freeing, up, freeing up a lot of time. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for, for listening to me for the last hour. And um, back over to you, Dale. Well, thanks so much, Kate. Um, yes, that, that last example, I think, is just a stunning one that uh, one workspace takes something that someone had to do repeatedly once a month for about a day and turns it into a 20-second job. And that's, that's really the home run example of what we are hoping to do here. Uh, folks, we have uh, gone slightly over our time. If you need to leave us, um, please do. We're going to hang around a bit to talk about a few of the questions that have come in. But if you have to leave, thanks so much for joining us. The recording of today's session will be coming out later today. Um, Kate, some folks have asked, uh, are any of these uh, workspaces able to be shared, or are those proprietary to your company? No, unfortunately, all the workspaces are proprietary. Yes. So you'll just have to look at Kate's uh, screen grabs and, uh, and go from that. I will also mention how to invite you to free training. Uh, if you want to understand more deeply what Kate was up to, um, you can certainly learn the tricks from our FME training. Now, Kate has applied the ingredients of FME in amazing ways, and you've heard that. You, many of you won't know the details how to actually use things like the string replacer and so on. And, and actually, Kate, I think you always use fan outs, don't you? I didn't see a single translation that didn't have a fan out today. Yes, I use fan out a lot. So if you're new yeah. to FME and you want to become a master like Kate, uh, study up on fan out. And maybe, um, Stephanie, we can at least send some links. I know that there's some good links on our new knowledge center about fan outs. That seems to be really key to. And actually, the other half of what Kate's up to is you're almost always merging inputs too, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. So, so that's you know a, a traditional way of using FME is I pick one file and I write one file, and now I have to do that over and over again for each file I deal with. Kate has taken it to a new level where she says, no, I'm going to pick a thousand files, or better yet, I'm going to say start on DGN. I'm going to let that all come in at once, and then on the output side, I'm going to use fanouts so that I can create. 50 or 100 or 7 output files without a human having to be involved in the naming. That's the kind of stuff you can learn at FME training, and we would invite you to, uh, to take advantage of that. So um, just lastly, in terms of other questions, we'll, uh, we'll spend a few minutes here just to wrap up um, for those that are able to stay. Um, Kate, someone asked if you're fishing out of the JPEG XIF tags, the direction. Now, I have to admit that I don't really know what they're asking about there, but there must have been direction in your example with the photos, and are you fishing that out somehow? Uh, yes. So it actually depends on the, the camera that you use to take, um, to take the photos, and not all, not all cameras will have that information in it. Um, but if most phones do, and most sort of newer GPS cameras do, and yes, that's just coming straight out the, um, the data, um, the metadata behind the photo. Yes. And so um, you probably expose an attribute somewhere in there, like those, those JPEG attributes are available on the, um, the features, and then you just basically make them available in your workspace, and then off you uh, go to fish the value out and then do stuff with it. Yes, that is correct. I've just made you presenter again, because um, if you wouldn't mind just uh, going back to some of your workspaces, someone has asked, hey, what's this contour generator? And I think. Um, I don't know if you have that workspace handy that was doing the contours. Yes. Do, you, do you have that one? Yes, I'll bring it up. Have I gone past it? Yes. Oh, no. Uh, I don't. I've, it's just in the presentation. Uh, that's oh, that's okay. <laughs> just even if you go to one of your existing ones, the top back to a workbench, and let's just type contour generator to show folks. Yeah. Um, if you would just throw one down, it is just a normal transformer built into FME. Kate's just going to type. Um, just anywhere, uh, if she just types contour, it'll come up with a list. There it is, and she hits enter. And now you can see it. And then if you hit the dot or the gears, the red gears, that's where you set the parameters. And so tolerances in here would get involved. 
And, um, and of course, the interval would probably be the key thing. In your example, what was the interval that you were using? Um, oh, I can't remember. It was probably um, five feet or one foot. Right, yes. So that's that one. Someone else asked, what is actually a string replacer doing? Do you mind just popping open one of your parameters on a string replacer? Oh, sure. So it so, takes an attribute. Yeah, go ahead and we'll talk us through it. Well, basically, it, it looks um, for a particular attribute. In this case, it was a capital JPEG, and I wanted to replace it with a small letter JPEG. So it basically just does a find and replace um, on, on, a, on a particular attribute. Yes, and you're not needing a regular expression. Um, that's a very powerful additional technique that if you wanted to find or change everything that started with a J and ended with a G, you could do that as well with, uh, with regular expressions. But a very powerful tool. In your case, you're, in this particular example, you're just whacking it to lowercase. Yeah. yeah. Very simple example. Yes. Um, someone else asked, the free training that SAFE offers, is that just recorded and all, um, kind of a, a do-it-yourself uh, at your own pace? We certainly do have a, a self-study set of materials that are online, but the free training classes that we do offer are actually, we give you an Amazon machine to log into, and you can interact with, um, with your own workbench, uh, solving some problems uh, yourself, following along with a live instructor who's available to help you through the various things. We often have even several of our staff helping folks out as they go through the exercises of the shared lecture uh, together. So yeah, it is a live thing. And no, you don't have to even be a customer. You can go ahead and um, spend the morning with us taking that. You can just sign up at that site that uh, was, was on our uh, slides, which you'll be getting later. But it is a live instructor. Um, someone else asked me if, uh, if I remember uh, a talk that was given in Sweden some years ago about the, the, the qualities of whether you're lazy or not and whether you're ambitious or not. And um, this was a talk very related to your first uh, chart, Kate, about time saving. And this individual said that uh, the person who does very well with a tool like FME is someone who is lazy and ambitious. Because they're lazy because they don't want to spend all day doing the same thing over and over again. They're ambitious because they want to get lots of stuff done. And so that's, um, that's that combination. It's a, it's a good quality, I suppose, to be lazy and ambitious. How would you react to that, Kate? I've actually heard that before. Um, I think I think in a way, I don't know if lazy is quite the right the right word. I, I'm ambitious is definitely correct because the time that yes. you're saving, you're not necessarily sitting back and twiddling your thumbs. You're just getting on to more interesting tasks. Right. It's about um, not wanting to do repetitive things over and over again, and instead that you refer to it as sort of the geek quality um, early on about wanting to make sure that you're, you're using your skills and your time in the most productive way. I know like your story about the CAD technician, there's also a, an optimizer um, personality type that really hates it when somebody has to do something that uses long amounts of time over and over again when it could be automated uh, because of course that person could be doing something way more useful and productive. Yes, exactly. And I'm sure the CAD technician didn't like sitting, spending an entire day drawing lines. He'd much rather be doing something more interesting as well. So, uh, yes, a win-win for everybody. Yes, yes. So, um, let's see. Uh, any other questions I should ask? Yes, yeah, slides are going to be sent out. Um, oh, time frugal. Somebody says we shouldn't say lazy. If you're frugal with your time, and you're ambitious. That might be a better way to phrase it. I like that. That's uh, David has suggested that. Um, someone else asked, uh, I, I, Kate, in your workflows, do you ever use web feature services or WFS? No, not very often. Not, not with yeah. an FME anyway, no. Um, some, it is the case that FME can read OGC WFSs. Um, the person wanted to do something much like your example where you were clipping, but instead of clipping, they wanted to query a WFS. And so the way that one can do that is let's say you have a shape file with three interesting polygons. Read the shape file, route the polygons to an FME transformer called a feature reader. And actually, Kate, do you want to just type feature reader and we can show folks what that looks like? Um, if you do a feature reader, there it is. And then pop open the gears on that. So the input comes in, and for each feature that goes by, then you, in the reader there, you would just say WFS, fill in your information, and down below, you would choose a spatial filter that says, hey, only give me the 
things that intersect. Actually, if you just click on spatial filter, you should be able to see some of the choices. Yeah, give me the things that, that intersect, and then it will do the right thing and read only the, the parts from the WFS that are um, of use. So that's, that's another example that someone was asking for. And um, someone else said, why would you ever copy an attribute? Kate, uh, can you give us an example why you'd copy an attribute? Um, yes, so sometimes you've got the same attributes coming from um, different input files, but actually you need to keep them, them separate. So you might be merging that data together, but you don't want to lose, you might lose that attribute um, from the one file. Um, so you copy it into a um, into basically a different name. Yes. And someone else asked, do you ever do modifications to a shapefile? And so I'll start by saying that FME does not let you in place change an existing shapefile. We can't do updates on a shapefile, but I have seen people that just set up translations that go from shapefiles to shapefiles doing some operations along the way, like copying attributes or renaming attributes or um, something with the geometry. In your uh, world, do you, do you end up using a lot of shapefiles, Kate? Uh, yes, yes we do, and I often do read in shapefiles and then read out shapefiles on the other side, but just they, they get modified, but it's obviously a new shapefile that gets created. Um, yes. Again, whether it's, it's doing intersections to add new attributes, spatial joins, things like that. It is the case, uh, according to our usage stats, for folks that, um, that tell us or are opt-in to tell us usage, the number one translation in FME is shape to shape. So um, that, you know, we end up supporting 250 plus formats and have an army of people supporting all these things. And yet, the number one thing people do is good old fashioned shape to shape, which has been around in FME since really 20 years ago. But, um, but it is kind of interesting how popular that format remains. Are you starting to see more file view database in your workflows or, or not a lot yet? Um, a, f a fair amount, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, shape, shape files are very annoying in that they limit the character length of your column names. Um, it's probably my biggest bugbear with them. And obviously, if you're using huge amounts of data, then file geodatabases are much better at handling um, large quantities of data than shape files. Yes. Yes. Um, one last one that I'll uh, just uh, throw out there. I, someone is asking, uh, they noticed in your examples that you're often using network drives. In your experience, is it faster to copy stuff locally, then run FME, run it all locally, and then send it, copy it back at the end to the network? Or do you just turn FME loose uh, against the network both at the beginning and the end? Again, it depends on how big the data is. Um, I tend to just run off the network because um, obviously when you start moving data and copying data, you can forget to move it back and it can cause some issues. Um, yeah. if, it's, if it's small files, I just run it straight off the network. Obviously, if I'm going to be running something for, for, for 8 hours or 12 hours or something like that, um, if they're huge files, then I'll, I'll copy it locally and, and run, it, run it off my C drive. See, I think uh, without me knowing a lot, my hunch is that some of the image formats might be well uh, suited. Like if you have a ginormous ECW file that you're going to be clipping pieces out of, it might be worth having that local so that FME doesn't have to keep going over the network to get parts of that file over and over again. But for things that we're just reading once sequentially, like DGN files and or shape files, it probably doesn't really buy you a lot to have copied it locally. That's my gut. Yes, definitely for image files it's worth doing. Or sometimes I just plug in an external hard drive and, and run it off that if you know so I don't yeah. up all the space in my C drive. Yeah. Uh, our friend uh, Kim from uh, New Zealand, uh, great to see you again, Kim, after a lot of years. I haven't really saw you for a long time, but Kim says eight hours, nothing should take longer than a cup of coffee. Um, interrupt it and find a better way. So that's kind of what you did for your CAD technician um, was turn his uh, eight-hour job into literally a pretty fastly gulped cup of coffee. Well, exactly, yeah. Okay, Obviously, so sometimes... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Kim. I was, I was, I was just going to say sometimes, um, like with the one and a half billion rows of CSV data that we had to sort out, you know, that, yeah. that, that took a little bit of time to run. But of course, it's not my time that's been spent on running that. It's the computer's time, and I can get on with other work while it's running in the background. Right. As Dr. Evil would say, a one billion is a very large number. So you know that that's really hard to even fathom that volume of data. And uh, and you're right. It's, in that case, you just sort of turn it loose and let computers grind and uh, and generate heat while they do that. 
So I think uh, we've exhausted all the questions. Thanks. There's still 150 folks that hung on till the very end. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us all this time. And Kate, I just want to thank you so much again, first of all, for making the journey out to Sacramento many months ago to share uh, a variation of this talk with the group there. And secondly, for uh, coming in early and, uh, and sharing this wisdom with us today. They, I, I didn't share all the feedback, but many folks were typing in, thanking you for some insights, and, uh, and definitely going to be able to apply this to their to their work. So thanks, Kate. Thanks all of you for joining us today. And um, if you're interested in FME, do take our training. Visit our brand new knowledge base. Kate, have you tried out the new knowledge.safe.com yet? Uh, no, I haven't, but I will take a look at it today. Yes, it's a brand new. Just went live. Um, Let's see, I think on Friday. And so uh, check that out. We have uh, really put a lot of effort into that. If you're wondering about FME and want to dig in, that's a great, great resource as well. So with that, I will say goodbye from beautiful Surrey, British Columbia. Kate, were you in San Francisco today? Yes, I am. Okay, well, enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your day in that beautiful city that, uh, that we at SAFE love so much. Thanks so much again, everyone. Thanks so much, Kate. All right, well, thank you. Okay, goodbye.